Hello, my name is John Phillips, and I'm the Assistant Oral Historian at the American Institute of Physics. Welcome to the fourth virtual Trimble Lecture of 2020 with Dr. Alexandra Huey, entitled Tests and Testing, the Case of Hearing and the Making of Modern Orality in the Long 20th Century. There are a few things to be aware of before we begin, as shown on the screen. First, all attendees will be in listen-only mode throughout the lectures. To submit questions to the speaker, please use the Q&A function. If you are having technical difficulties, use the chat feature. Finally, closed captions are available for this lecture. To turn them on, click the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now, a few remarks from our CEO, Dr. Michael Maloney. I'm Michael Maloney, I'm the CEO of the American Institute of Physics, and I want to welcome you to this Line Starling Trimble Lecture Series. Uh, this is part of AIP's focus on researching and understanding the heritage of the physical sciences, and most importantly for this event, promulgating that understanding broadly amongst our own community here at AIP. And frankly, since we've all been working remotely, also um, working to promulgate understanding of the history of physics broadly amongst the global community. So we really want to welcome you here to AIP. We hope you enjoyed this event and we hope you will join us again at future AIP events. Next, a few words from the director of the Center for History of Physics, Dr. Greg Good. Hi, I'm Greg Good, director of the Center for History of Physics at the American Institute of Physics in College Park, Maryland. Welcome to the fourth webcast presentation in the Tremble Lecture Series for 2020. This is the 10th year of these lectures and five years since astrophysicist Virginia Trimble created the endowed fund that supports the lectures. In normal times, these lectures are live at the American Center for Physics. For now, they live entirely online on Zoom webinar and on the AIP history page on YouTube. Join us for four more lectures from November 2020 through February 2021. The Trimble Lectures represent the dedication of AIP's Center for History of Physics to deepen and broaden understanding of science and its social dimensions. This broader understanding for historians and writers begins with primary sources, from letters and hard drives to oral history interviews. The Center supports and encourages research through grants and grants and aid, brings early career scholars together, and then brings fresh works to the public through the Trimble Lectures. AIP is proud to sponsor lectures by prominent historians, scientists, and writers with deep knowledge and interesting perspectives. Today's speaker, Alexandra Huey, is an associate professor of history at Mississippi State University and co-editor of the History of Science journal, ISIS. She has focused on music, sound, and the laboratory in her monograph, The Psychophysical Ear, Musical Experiments, Experimental Sounds, 1840 to 1910, in several articles, and in her co-edited 2013 OSIRIS volume. Her two current projects examine the co-development of listening and background music technology and how scientists listen to the environment. Today, Professor Huey will discuss Tests and Testing, the Case of Hearing and the Making of Modern Orality in the Long 20th Century. Welcome, Professor Huey. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be invited to participate in the Lynn Starling Trimble Lecture Series. Um, I want to say a special thanks to the AIP staff that coached me through this new to me medium and format. And thank you to all of you for being present here um, in this <laughs> attenuated form, especially when so many other pressing issues demand our attention these days. My presentation today is drawn from two projects. The first is a recently published, like October 1st, <laughs> recently published anthology I co-edited with Victoria Takachik and Mara Mills through a series of essays, Testing Hearing, pictured here, considers both the testing of hearing and the testing with hearing to explore the co-creation of modern epistemic 
and auditory cultures, indeed the creation of modern orality. So I'll talk a bit more about this test and testing in the history of science and technology and discuss three case studies of the power of tests to standardize listening practices, train bodies, and generate new knowledge ending with my co-authored contribution to this volume on the underwater ear. The other two main examples I'll discuss in this talk today, which are also hearing tests very broadly understood, come from one of my current monograph projects, Sonifying Space, a history of the science of background music, in which I ask how the sounds of the environment and the listening processes of those that inhabit it shape knowledge about it and its occupants' experience of it. I ask how new perceptual systems co-developed with new environments. And to get at some of these questions, I focus on the co-development of background music. So here I mean environmental music, elevator music, music. Um, so the co-development of background music technology and new conceptions of the environment via new forms of listening and the introduction of new sounds in both personal and public space through the development of recording and replay technology. And since I am a historian of science, I am especially interested in the role of scientific ideas and objects in the changing understanding of built sonic environments. Listening technologies did more than just amplify human ears over time and space. They also trained, standardized, and generated new knowledge. In the case of the science of background music, science contributed to new musical aesthetics and new forms of listening in very explicit and deliberate ways fundamentally altering the soundscape of the 20th century. In the coda to our edited volume, historian of science Hans-Jörg Hans Reinberger noted that tests are reifications of experiments. They are until they are not. I think this is something that has become evident across um, sort of the work that I've done and a lot of the work that we did towards this volume. Test complement experiments confirm and standardize knowledge generated by experiments. But the contributions to testing hearing show that tests also generated their own knowledge separate from experiment. And when preparing our volume, we realized how crucial practices of testing were and are in the sciences, the arts, industry, and daily life. Tests define our lives, currently probably more than ever, Shifts in the trajectory of testing since the early modern era redefined what qualified as a test subject, as well as the potential contributions of these subjects to the co-construction of knowledge. Everyone and everything can be put to the test, whether by epistemological, industrial, artistic, or other forces. And our volume argues that testing became an enduring and wide-ranging social practice in the modern period. Individuals engaged with tests from the moment they are born. Tests are built into daily lives with astonishing pervasiveness. Testing is a cultural technique comparable to other key techniques such as writing, reading, painting, experimenting, seafaring, and filtering. In the history of testing, hearing took on a decisive and dual role of test object with sort of an enormous range of hearing tests being developed and test instrument for the testing of human health and skills, materials, technologies, spaces, environments, all with hearing. This long interrelationship of testing and hearing, testing of and testing with hearing, our volume argues, was responsible for the co-creation of modern epistemic and auditory cultures. So the testing of hearing proves to be one of the richest sites for historical inquiry into the epistemic power of tests. The education of speaking and hearing citizens, the development of telecommunication tools, and the optimization of public spaces and the multimedia arts encourage the proliferation of hearing tests, as well as the invention of new procedures such as screening. The modern scientific and popular understanding of hearing, the practice of hearing itself, reinforced through standardization and training, co-developed with such testing. Hearing no longer exists without audiometry, for example. Tests were and are not only disciplining, normalizing, or objectifying tools, but also indices of complex epistemic dynamics 
and of disciplinary negotiations between the natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, arts, and industry. Forms of hearing were normalized and at times standardized. Tests too were normalized and then applied to new and different epistemic problems, often with curious results. So hearing tests, we argue in our volume, have not only redefined modern hearing, but they have also altered the very meaning of the test and the academic fields from which they emerged. So again, hearing tests have epistemic power. Okay, so we've laid all that out. You wanna have a party? You wanna have a mood change party? You have to say yes, I realize that this is all just sort of a black screen, but um, pull out a sheet of paper. I don't know if I'll ever be a Southerner, but I live in the South right now. So let's do a little historical reenacting. Here's your hearing test. This is a mood change test form. The Edison Phonograph Company encouraged consumers to fill out these either individually in their shops or at home alone or at mood change parties. So we're gonna have a mood change party right here over Zoom. So read it over really quickly. Hopefully you can read it. Um, on your sheet of paper, you need to write down your the date. You need to write down, I guess, number one, two, and three here, your location, uh, the time, I guess it's the afternoon for most people, and the weather outside. Now I'm going to play an Edison recreation record. This is number 80128. It is the first part of the William Tell Overture. Consider what kind of music did you feel like hearing? Now you have to choose from these options. I guess you could choose more than one if you want, but you're restricted by these possible um, typologies of music. You have to interpret them yourself. Uh, then you can move on to number five. So what was your mood immediately preceding this test? Maybe you were irritated that I was making you take a test, um, or maybe you were depressed or nervous. Um, I was speaking to someone else actually about this, um, these, these sort of opposed options, serious or gay, worried or carefree. So it sort of sets up 
these binaries, um, which is kind of interesting. And um, she was telling me, this is someone that studies this, um, a colleague, but this is, you know, the earliest she's seen this um, in this test. Um, and then in number six, you can write out basically in a sentence um, your mood change. So how you felt before, you fill in that blank to your mood after. And then you can write down here in this first line that you listen to Edison record 80128, which is the William Tell Overture. If you have any additional comments on the manner in which your mood change occurred, you can add that. Um, on the back, if you also want to add some more comments, you could do that. And the idea would be that you would then sign this, I guess, put your address um, and then mail this off to um, the Edison Laboratories in Orange, New Jersey. So I guess one thing to think about is, you know, whether or not if you heard this piece again um, in the future, whether you would have a similar mood change something get reified through the practice of writing this down or filling out this form. I guess another thing to consider is that now, um, if you didn't previously, you now have a functional understanding of music. You are thinking of the ways in which music might affect your mood. Congratulations. In 1914, so I'm going to give you some little more background on this um, this test itself and, and where Edison went with it. Um, in 1914, the Edison company, seeing value in large-scale marketing schemes aimed at cultivating new forms of listening in the public, launched a program of what they alternately termed demonstration recitals, tone tests, and recreation recitals. And building on the success of the demonstration recitals, the Edison company approached Walter Van Dyke Bingham who was then the director of the Division of Applied Psychology at the Carnegie Institute of Technology. He's probably best known uh, for his role in developing early um, IQ tests and job placement tests. In 1918, the Edison Carnegie Music Research Program was given $10,000 and a set of Edison recreation records to study, quote, the psychological reactions which definite forms of music produce in the human mind, end quote. And among other activities, uh, the research program performed a series of lab experiments in which musical individuals practiced in introspection. This is sort of a self-witnessing technique in experimental psychology at the time. Um, these individuals gave their emotional responses to various recreation records. And the results of these experiments were then used to develop this mood change chart. The mood change test or mood change chart was a grand experiment. Again, this was distributed widely. The public was encouraged to participate. Um, here you see an advertisement. This is um, William J. Burns, Celebrity Private Eye. Um, and this is his mood change chart that he has filled out. And um, he's asking everyone to join Mr. Edison in this experiment. And they talk about how the experiment becomes more rigorous as more people participate. So you can be, you can be part of this, um, this great scientific endeavor. Over 27,000 mood change charts were filled out and returned um, to the Edison labs uh, for Bingham to analyze. And this allowed the Edison Carnegie Music Research Program to gather a massive amount of data on the public's listening practices. I would argue that filling out the mood change test also primed participants to think about music in terms of its mood effects. So sensory perceptual shifts and epistemological developments were very much a consequence of listening with this form. Sadly, um, at least to me as a historian, those 27,000 filled out mood change charts were not preserved. There's a handful um, that are sort of rattling around in the Edison archives. There are, however, um, lots of reports on the organized tests um, that remain. And an analysis of the return mood change charts culminated in the publication of this short little pamphlet um, called Mood Music, a compilation of 112 Edison recreations according to, quote, what they will do for you. And this was distributed at Edison shops. 
So the booklet included an introduction summarizing Edison's innovations and in sound recording technology, um, culminating with new music, as well as a discussion of the Edison Carnegie Music Research Program's work by Bingham. Mood music was organized around 12 mood effects of music. Um, a brief description of each mood was given, and then a list of 10 to 12 Edison recreation records, complete with their catalog number and their price, that would consistently elicit this mood. Um, sometimes there would be a before and after Im image that illustrated the motor and the mood effects of the properly selected recreation record. So here, this is the before and after of to bring you peace of mind, that is a mood. You can see this poor woman here is described as nervous and exhausted from a day of shopping. She's collapsed on the sofa, her parcels are just sort of flung around her feet. In the next image, she's sitting up, she's alert, she's next to an Edison phonograph, apparently soothed and refreshed by music. And this facing page of these images, you know, listed 12 Edison recreation records that science had established would bring the listener peace of mind. We can understand the efforts of the Edison Carnegie Music Program to be one of defining and standardizing private listening and of actively creating or at least attempting to create a new type of listening. Further, these efforts fostered in listeners through the process of filling out the mood change chart like you just did, purchasing music with the aim of, quote, making it work for them, end quote. So a new understanding of the role of music as a functional one. Want to change your mood? Reinvigorate your body? You consult your copy of mood music to make your selection from your personal record collection. I should note that this also implicitly encouraged the listener to organize their record collection by mood, reinforcing the functional role of music in their daily lives. I want to now briefly discuss listening surveys. I treat surveys as a form of test capable of standardizing knowledge as well as generating new ideas and practices. So in what ways is a survey a test? It creates and standardizes experiences, um, new understandings of such concepts as music, um, which can be intended or unintended. It's also a means by which listeners surveyed are prompted to consider their listening experience as an investigative object. I would say at the core of this co-development of modern technology dependent background music um, and the active cultivation of new forms of listening was also a, a kind of feedback loop um, of testing increasingly functional applications of music. From psychological experiments to surveys to the recommendation algorithms of contemporary streaming music platforms. And I think related to that, an in real kind of like ambivalent acceptance of such applications by listeners. Was each test of the efficacy of music on their happiness or their focus or their consumption habits, um, the subject gained an awareness of the test, in turn altering the relationship between individuals and communities' understanding of their sonic environment and their experiment experience of it. So I want to talk a little bit about listener surveys um, that were used in work settings. By the early 1920s, uh, phonographs had been introduced to factories for use during breaks. Uh, within a few years, the device was connected to factory amplification systems to play music for workers as they worked. By the end of the decade, the National Bureau for the Advancement of Music performed a massive survey of the use of recorded music in factories across the United States. And their results were that for, for employers, the benefits were increased production, um, a kind of common meeting ground for executives in the workforce, improved morale, um, at least as witnessed by surveyed employers, reduced turnover, and the possibility of goodwill advertising. For workers, the Bureau found that music counteracted the monotony and the fatigue of the job. It opened up avenues for self-expression, brought the worker widened friendships and a social outlet, and we can see here the application of the ideas that were cultivated by the Edison Carnegie Research Group already, right? The music could affect the mind and the body. The study of the working environment, and we can use sort of like the Hawthorne Works experiments on light and ventilation, 
in the Westinghouse plant from 1824 to, sorry, 1924 to 1932 as a reference, co-developed with the increased application of music to it. And by the early 1940s, nearly 3,000 plants were using some form of industrial broadcasting system to play music for their workers. Music, the company Music claimed by the mid 1950s that 40 million people heard their music every day. Installing a plant broadcasting system could cost from 250 to $100,000, depending on the size of the plant. So they were not cheap, these systems. And you can read these costs as an indication of the perceived efficacy of these systems. There were sort of two main systems that were operating in the 1940s um, that were used for broadcasting music in industrial settings. Muzak, which had been founded in the early 1930s, recorded its own music in-house and then piped in curated programs via electrical wires to subscribers. RCA Victor instead offered a subscription service, so plants would receive new records regularly as well as guidelines for the plant's music directors. And both systems offered services of sound engineers um, and even evaluations by psychologists um, to optimize the original installation. In his 1944 Guide to Industrial Sound, the sound engineer Harold Burris Myers explained that, quote, subjective studies such as questionnaires are useful, but often do not lead to the results which can be properly evaluated. Objective studies, however, such as time or output studies are arduous, but well worth the effort where they can reasonably be set, where they can reasonably be set up. They give statistical results which show at a glance comparison between one type of program or another, end quote. So as the background music company Muzak made its case for the efficacy of music in industrial settings, they relied heavily on this objective countable data. So they like to count lateness, objects produced, um, mistakes, things like that. And, and so we can see, um, and they use this to sort of measure productivity increases um, or decreases over time. So we can see in these two charts here um, how productivity increased both in the daily rhythms of the factory floor and over the course of the week with the addition of music. And so not only were there sort of, um, you can, yeah, so you can sort of see the averages over time um, here. Muzak also used worker preference surveys um, to sort of refine their technique and I think cultivate their programming, um, but also to some extent, I would say, as a branding strategy. Um, so you can sort of look at the questions that are being asked here. Um, and, you know, so most of them are like, you know, so they, they're, they're collecting demographic data, which is already kind of interesting. Um, but most of these are yes, no questions or like or dislike questions. Um, there's not a lot of choice here. And um, you can think about how a worker might look at this, um, you know, and they're sort of reading through this, they're thinking about music that they like. Um, and then they're being asked how music affects their mind and body. Um, and they're sort of thinking about it. Um, they fill out the form, they might consider their answers. Um, they might turn in the form and then hear music over the loudspeakers and think again about the form and whether or not their answers, you know, is this music truly relieving my fatigue? Um, or then when they are fatigued, consider putting some music on in their own home. So again, you know, in this way, listening with a form, with a survey, a test, um, this test introduced the possibility of and then in turn standardized this understanding that music could be functional for the worker. And not only that, but it was music, not music that was effective, right? So you see here, um, music makes my work more enjoyable, yes or no. I wish the music would be stopped immediately, yes or no. So music's trying to distinguish what they offer from just plain old music. These are um, attitude, like a sort of music preference survey um, that was put out by RCA Victor. They instead encourage faculty managers uh, to use their industrial sound system to kind of showcase individual workers and highlight their individuality and their personhood 
Um, they should have them come into the control room and sort of perform over the loudspeakers for the entire factory, or the music director should host like a, a quiz or something weekly, and certainly the manager should, you know, sort of give little speeches. And this was, um, RCA explained, the best way to demonstrate the humanity of the factory executive. He would show, he, he was always a he, um, showed that he cared about his workers with sound. Built into this management strategy was the assumption that the workers were actually listening. Um, but it was also through the worker surveys as tests um, that individual tastes were reported to listening management. And I think that this is kind of a central feature of the RCA Victor industrial sound system. It, um, there was a mechanism through which management could improve morale by embracing the workers as individuals that had specific tastes. Um, again, this was, you know, done through sound. It was only possible via sound. So here's another sort of industrial music request card. Um, here you see some women, you know, requesting music. Um, down below, is, this is from some coverage of this one factory and their sort of internal newsletter. Um, this factory uses the loudspeakers also to perform this kind of wolf call. Um, so if anyone shows up late, they get kind of singled out through the loudspeaker system and, and shouted at, um, apparently. And so here, I think we can think about the way in which um, the RCA plant broadcasting system of management, engagement, and worker music requests attempted to create, and it's hard to say if this is deliberate, but it did, I think, um, create something like a panacoustic listening system. So everyone is assuming that everyone is listening. And as a consequence, there's a lot of, you know, self-disciplining and better worker performance. These surveys established essential tension in the larger narrative of increasingly deliberately sonified spaces. How is the knowledge of the mood effects of music commodified and peddled first to the individual listener and then to the individual that wanted to control multiple listeners? So really, what does music do for me to others? By testing their listening population via survey, the collaboration between psychologists, sound engineers, fledging music industry, both device and recording, revealed their functionalist goals to their form listeners. In doing so, they prompted a general understanding that music could have direct body and mood effects. They also standardized the associations between specific pieces and specific moods and potentially weakened the efficacy of the data gathered, prompting a need to develop new and more precise sound products. The feedback loop cycled into a cynical arms race of sorts and was also expanded out from the individual to captive and seemingly free aggregations of people through the combined efforts of scientists, marketers, and management. And finally, an examination of the use of surveys and in industrial music systems of RCA, Victor, and Muzak to communicate to workers that management was listening to them. That is, where there were speakers, there were also microphones. So through an auditory panopticism of sorts, the modification of the environment, here I'm going to jump through that a little bit. Um, the modification of the environment through work music, combined with modifications of individual sensory perceptuals, sensory perceptions of it through forms and surveys and tests, hopefully resulted in happier and conveniently more efficient workers. So again, in this presentation, I'm trying to get at some of this dynamic and attempting to measure how individuals understood their sonic environment. In this case, psychologists altered their experience of it. A comparison of the two main systems of industrial music in the years immediately surrounding World War II reveals this dynamic at work, but also the development of new, I would argue, sound dependent ideas about labors and laborers. Music facilitated work, music itself work. The regular, regular use of worker listening surveys also reinforced ideas about functional music and workers' minds, altering their subsequent experiences of both the tests and the applied music. 
because that created a new kind of labor, essentially. This is an argument I make somewhere else. Um, music or sound granted workers individuality, um, personhood in the case of RCA Victor system. So you have a, a new kind of laborer, I would say. And also, you know, metaphorically, but also functionally through the circulation of these surveys, these tests, um, the demonstrate there was a sort of demonstration that management was quote listening and here i think we're really only one step away and certainly less than a decade from a pan acoustic system in which the devices that make sounds also collect them so again where there were loudspeakers there were microphones these previous case studies illustrate the implications of the science and technology of background music for the public. In this last case study, I want to show how testing hearing fueled the development of a new field of science, among other things. Uh, so let us turn briefly to the testing of non-human and maybe even post-human hearing. And our contribution to testing hearing, the edited volume, Nino Camprubi and I examined the transition from a secret epistemology of error to the open practice of marine bioacoustics via Cold War sonar testing and training protocols to show how sounds that were silent to human ears remained exceedingly, existentially even, meaningful to humans. For humans, listening down into the ocean is a profoundly technological experience. The difficulties for the unmediated ear to make sense of sound underwater rendered the ocean a mysterious and sonically ambiguous space. The hydrophone provided the means for the technological hearing of the oceans that would put an end to this imagination. But it did so only in the context of war and then potentially marine biology later. During World War I or World War II and the Cold War, Submarine warfare triggered military interest in underwater sounds of, of any origin. Marine biologists contributed to the effort by helping identify the myriad of sounds that could hinder detection of an enemy vessel by sonar operators. Shared technologies and goals meant shared forms of listening. Sonar men, and they were always men, and marine biologists heard the ocean the same way. Then, as they began to listen to different sounds and listen for different sounds, their ears began to diverge. The hydrophone, as the sonic technology came to be called, gained increasing attention during World War I, although the actual detection record of hydrophones in that war is a little bit dubious. During the interwar period, their accuracy greatly increased, aided by innovations in telecommunications technology, especially the telephone. Hydrophones could, by the 1940s, filter out undesired sounds and highlight certain frequencies, amplify interesting ranges, and even detect mechanical waves at frequencies lower than 20 hertz, and transform them into audible signals. This transduction process, as well as the human element of listening and analyzing the sonified sea, has been obscured by the development of what later became um, called active sonar during World War II. The role of the ear in listening to the sounds generated by hydrophone in passive sonar um, was much more prominent. By the outbreak of World War II, in which German U-boats were again dictating the terms of ocean warfare, the oceans were no longer silent. On the contrary, sonar men hunting submarines were confronted with a cacophony of sounds, friendly engines, the turbines of their own vessels, storms, waves, breaking ice, and marine life. Their devices heard too many sounds. It was well known that several species of marine animals um, produced sounds, but the urgencies of anti-submarine warfare turned those sounds into noises to be discerned apart from relevant signal. Sounds had to be distinguished as submarine and not submarine, or human-made and natural. Testing listening devices and classifying hitherto unknown sounds were a single process. So again, the making of the underwater ear in World War II offers a rare case of forced and rapid standardization of perception. Testing and training the best ears allowed the US Navy, essentially, to define the collective experience of listening below the sea's surface. In 1941, about 50 sonar operators graduated each month from the Navy's training schools. At the beginning of 1942, 
the U.S. having just entered the war, um, that number rose to about 100 a month. By the end of 1940, by the end of 1942, it was 500 a month. So the need to rapidly train such large quantities of people for a specialized and vital task posed a serious issue. And tracing the history of how the test developed um, to select and certify sonar operators in this period illustrates how tests were critical to the creation and standardization of the early underwater year. So an evolving set of tests to select and train sonar operators were developed during this period. You know what, I realize I can go back a second. So there was the audiometric test um, to just sort of check for normal hearing. Um, then there was a musical pitch duration and volume discrimination test. This is often called the Carl Seashore test of musical talent. Then a pitch memory test that had been created by the Navy. After selection, there was training and standardization um, that would continue at the sonar operator schools. And once the best ears had been selected, they had to be adapted to the underwater world. So students performed exercises in tone differentiation and recognition and were then repeatedly subjected to the Navy pitch memory test. And so the selection test was now also a training method. Interestingly, this can, they continued to use this test um, and, and they would use it to then test the performance of the test itself. And over the next couple of years, the Navy pitch memory tests were repeatedly modified in the hopes of rendering better underwater ears. The most important part of sonar operator training was learning to recognize sounds specific to the ocean. So from 1942 to 1945, um, the US Navy produced something like 13 manuals and five albums um, with recordings of some of the sounds sonar men would be expected to experience. These records varied from individual sounds, um, so a propeller, a cargo ship, a snapping shrimp, to a more realistic cacophony of several sounds with say like an enemy vessel or a sperm whale um, tucked in there. So prospects were taught to distinguish, recognize and memorize the relevant sounds. This was done through repetitive listening work. So we can think about technologies such as loudspeakers and recordings made it possible for the thousands of sonar operators to trainees to hear the same sound. Training records, manuals, and tests made a collective listening experience of, say, like a croaker, a fish, um, possible, um, in part because the records, manuals, and tests through their limited examples circumscribed the sound of the croaker. So it's also defining specific sounds. So the underwater sounds and the underwater ears were co-created, standardized, made reliable, and mobile. Most of these recordings included a final test. We're going to do one here um, to assess whether students had acquired the required listening skill. So in these tests, eight to 10 sounds were played in a row and the prospects were asked to identify them. Animal and man-made sounds recorded through hydrophones were now testing human ears and by extension, testing the Navy's anti-submarine warfare defense system. The tests also provided data for researcher studies of perception through psychophysical methods, asking questions that would follow up, asking questions about hearing pure tones against background noise, um, the ability to maintain attention under boring or stressful situations, and the perceivings of sounds, the perception of sounds of very short duration. Okay, so this is a sono buoy training recording. And um, if this were a real test, you would actually need to identify each of these. But right now we're just going to, you can just think about whether it's a submarine or a not submarine. And as we go through, I'll tell you what they are. That was not a submarine, that was an ice flow. <laughs> Sounds kind of mechanical, but it is also not a submarine. That was a cargo ship. <laughs> That's a rather famous example. Those are snapping shrimp. 
which in large numbers can sound quite loud and also rather mechanical, but again, not a submarine. That was a sperm whale. this one before. This is a croaker. I think it's related to a black drum. It's an Atlantic fish. That was a submarine. It probably sounded familiar um, from all of your Cold War movie watching. Here's one more. That was a toadfish. The toadfish was actually a really problematic species uh, for the training of the underwater ear. Its characteristic sort of grumpy tooting um, would be amplified to something more like a scream during mating season. And this would actually interfere with acoustically triggered mines, homing torpedoes, and submarine detecting equipment. So this threat of the toadfish prompted the Naval Ordnance Laboratory to perform a series of studies on noise-making marine life to classify and better understand the nature and distribution of what they called natural background noise. This was the first comprehensive precision measurement of the frequency distribution and intensity of underwater noise-making creatures. The research program was extended over the years and produced not only the highest intensity recordings of underwater background sounds ever made at the time, but also the first documented recordings of several species of noise-making fish. Eventually, this led to the creation of reference files of underwater sounds that could be compared to recordings of unknown sounds in order to determine whether the human made, they were human-made or not. The sonification of the ocean co-developed with new biological knowledge and technologies of submarine detection. In our contribution to testing hearing, we go into much more depth about this divergence of the underwater ears, the sonar operators versus marine bioacousticians. Bio so I would sort of recommend you take that book up if you are curious about what happens. So the test for the underwater ears testing the underwater ears. I think some conclusions that we draw from that is that the tests were malleable. They were full of meanderings and loops. Intake tests became training tests, became indicators of the need for new and different tests. Tests also opened the way to new bioacoustic discoveries, such as the deafening sound of large numbers of snapping shrimp. These tests also made commensurable the different realities they checked against one another. By deploying the ear to test the hydrophone and the hydrophone to test sound classification, tests laid the basis for new epistemes of underwater acoustics. Finally, tests played a crucial role in producing the new ontology of the noisy ocean. So testing played a recursive and reinforcing role in the development of the underwater ear in the years during and immediately following World War II. The demands of submarine warfare motivated the rapid development of new technologies and new listening skills. In turn, sounds never before heard by humans were defined, classified, and standardized. The ocean became noisy. As both the nature of the Cold War and the goals of biology shifted, the ways of, to listen underwater multiplied. Onboard sonar monitoring, global SOSIS arrays, spectrograms, conditioning behavior of humans and fish all push, or test really, the limits, role, and understanding of the underwater ear. Making the oceans audible for humans was much more a transformation process than it was a discovery. And I think this point is further underscored when we consider the frequencies outside our auditory thresholds that populate the ocean and are only rendered audible through modern technology. There is some anthropocentrism in calling certain mechanical waves infra or ultra sounds, since the designation only exists in reference to the human listener. 
This nevertheless reminds us that while sounds, in order to be heard, require subjects to exist as such, there is no need for these subjects to be human. Testing the underwater ear created and mobilized a plurality of sounds and listening subjects, which subsequently co-evolved, diverged, and even clashed. This image is of a 2012 installation piece uh, by Jason DeCares Taylor. It's five meters underwater off the coast of Punta Nizuc, Mexico. It is covered with casts of children's ears and contains an acoustic recorder that collects 30 second clips every 15 minutes. And it is called the listener. So here to conclude, um, test subjects and testing practices suffuse the history of modern science and medicine. Like the ubiquitous experiment, tests carry epistemological power. Yet the history of testing remains rather under-theorized. I've examined testing through a series of exemplary cases of testing of hearing and testing with hearing during the long 20th century, from the tone test of the Edison Phonograph Company to the worker surveys of MUSAC to the training protocols of early sonar operators in the US Navy. Hearing tests have been employed in both the sciences and the arts, functioning as cultural techniques of assessment, training, and standardization. Applied at large scale, tests of seemingly small measure, right, of auditory acuity, of hearing range, helped redefine the modern concept of hearing as such. The historical study of testing of and with hearing illuminates the co-creation of modern epistemic and auditory cultures. The history of testing hearing and using hearing to test other objects and ideas prompts us to think more broadly about the role of listening with its evolving values and applications in the very way we sense and perceive and move through the world. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Huey. We will now begin the question and answer period. As a brief reminder, if you have any questions for the speaker, please submit them to the Q&A feature in Zoom. The chat is reserved for technical difficulties. Okay, uh, Dr. Huey, uh, are you on? Yeah. Hi, yes. Hi. Uh, okay, so our first question is uh, from Barry McKee. Uh, is Taylor's underwater listening post available online? That is a good question, and I have no idea. Um, I imagine if it was installed in 2012 that it probably doesn't exist anymore, but it may, I mean, I assume it was maybe taken down, but um, it's possible. I hadn't even looked into it. Um, I, I assume, I think that originally the idea was that it would sort of broadcast this in some form. It wasn't simply collecting these sounds, um, but yeah, I don't actually know much more about it. I found it a really um, captivating image and, and just sort of the idea of the, of the art piece I thought was really compelling. Okay, thank you. Um, can you say something about uh, training, testing and standardizing of other phenomena uh, and observation in World War II, uh, radar, weather observation, calculators, things like that? So um, I don't have a super complete um, answer to that question. This is actually more Lino's area of expertise. I was like the marine bioacoustics person on the team, but certainly um, there were similar protocols and, and you have to think that most of these were done through um, the military. Um, I think the weather, weather monitoring systems were also run through the military at this time. So yeah, so radar and weather monitoring were certainly, I think, part of um, 
a similar kind of rapid ramp up um, mass testing and training system. And, and this was part of why we were so interested in this period because it was applied to so many people so quickly um, and over such a short period of time. And, um, and that sort of had all the, the weight and, and the money of um, the US military behind it. I think back on one of these slides, I can even pull it up. Um, let's see if I can share my screen competently. And here we go. Maybe, maybe I need to be allowed to do this. Um, so on my list of um, tests that were sort of used during the, sorry, I'm trying to like look at it and maybe whoever can moderate this can give me screen sharing privileges. But during the sort of list of different types of tests that were used, um, in the underwater ear training, one of the ones that was listed that I didn't talk about. Um, so there was, you know, the uh, um, audiometric test. There was the seashore test. There was the Navy um, pitch memory test, and then there was this kind of like musical um, sort of stratification test that was used. And this was kind of a, a a test that was implemented out of desperation because they had to. You know, they had like sailors on ships and ships needed to head out to sea and they still hadn't identified who would be on the sonar operator. So they basically surveyed everyone on board and asked them, do you have any musical training? Did you, did you used to sing or play an instrument in the band? And if so, you're now the sonar operator. And so there was also this kind of um, very quick and um, maybe not so rigorous test that we thought was interesting because it just sort of assumed that musical skill translated to good sonar listening skill, which it's you know debatable whether or not that was necessarily true. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another question from Paul Guinnessy. Uh, recently, it's been found that whales and dolphins uh, have changed their vocal range to be heard over shipping transportation noise. Uh, that's changed again during COVID because the traffic has, has dialed down. Um, were similar changes discovered during World War II uh, in terms of, and, and the sonar operators picked up on that? So that's an excellent question. And um, I think for the most part, they didn't, they couldn't collect that data on a scale that would have allowed them to make that judgment. So the SOSIS array wasn't a sort of set up until I think what the late sixties or so. Um, I know that marine bioacousticians use it now actually to help track um, locations of whales. There's some collaborative work that's done with the US Navy and, um, and it's, it's amazing. I've talked to some of them, right? And they, they couldn't go into details, um, but you know, because it's classified information, but they could locate, you know, like from Newport News, um, they could locate, you know, the, the location of a, right whale up in Newfoundland, right? And so they, you know, there's a sort of incredible amount of um, precision. And they could also, there was some collaborative project that was being used to monitor whale presence in shipping channels near Boston. And um, so if there were whales there, then they could ask, you know, the boats to slow down so they wouldn't hit them. Now, in terms of the sound that's being generated and how that affects whales, I mean, that was very obvious, I think, by the time they were using the SOSIS data. Um, before that, I don't know if they necessarily saw the correlation. Now it's pretty clear. This is also, I think, related to shifts in um, marine biology where they become more interested in behavior and are looking at the correlation between sound making and sort of presumed listening and behavior. And so they are seeing these kinds of behaviors where whales will react to, you know, a sounding, you know, by all of these um, you know, sort of petrochemical companies that are sort of doing these surveys of the ocean floor. Um, it's quite obvious that um, the whales are reacting to that and they can see all of that in real time now. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that, that sounds like a good answer. Um, could you maybe uh, say a little bit, if, if you know, about the basis that, uh, that the company that made the survey used for determining what kinds of music would be good or useful for this, uh, noting that on the survey, there is a category for hillbilly music, but not for jazz, for example. Yeah, so that's one of the things I'm super interested in. Um, so you can track, um, 
what at least the people creating these forms think are music of interest um, to the workers, but then they also are trying to balance that against the music that they think would be um, most efficacious um, and sort of keep workers working. And um, so I think that's, that's part of the reason jazz is left off. The other reason is by the like 19, 40s, it's pretty well established, or at least Muzak has decided um, that there's a very specific type of music that is good to be played, you know, on the factory floor. And it needs to be maybe two minutes long. It can't have a long introduction. It has to be um, instrumental, but not with strings. It has to have a, like a standard beat. And, um, and so it's fine if it's sort of a known piece, but there are some known pieces that you can never play. There was all this discussion about how you can never play deep in the heart of Texas because all the workers will stop working and they'll start clapping along. And um, so there's sort of concerns about that. They want to appear like they care about workers and they actually have this. I mean, this is in the like internal memos. You know, they're like, well, we need to, you know, we, we don't want to sort of give the game away. We want the workers to think that we care. Um, at the same time, we want them to keep working. And so I think this is why jazz gets left out. I think this is why um, they sort of, they leave gospel in, but they don't do church music, um, stuff like that. So, but it also changes over time, right? There's this period where everyone wants Hawaiian music. And um, again, I think that maybe factory managers are a little unsure about that, if that was gonna sort of make everyone chill out too much. They also had very specific um, sort of prescriptions on when you should play music and for how long. And they recognized that, you know, the, the workers were sort of captive listeners and you can't annoy them with music. And also if you play music all the time, it won't be as effective. So they usually recommended just playing it for 30 minutes at a time, um, kind of mid morning and um, maybe right after lunch to kind of get people back to um, their stations, but you should never play March music then because then people will think it's too um, disciplinary. And then again at like 3.30 or four o'clock in the afternoon to kind of help people power through this exact moment of sort of productivity lag that maybe we're living through right now. Great, and then uh, one last question before we wrap up. Um, were these mood tests and uh, either music or other uh, musical interventions uh, ever used for any kind of social control other than just labor productivity or was it really focused there? So um, Edison, the Edison program, I don't think that they were thinking about, I mean, even Edison, they, they thought a little bit about using it in, um, in education and a little bit about um, applications and work settings, but there it was, you know, sort of before the phonograph was being hooked up to the loudspeaker system. So they weren't really thinking about using it in like public address kind of technologies like together. Um, so they weren't thinking about sort of other applications beyond kind of individual mood control. And again, for Edison, it's very clearly a marketing effort um, for their phonograph company. Later on, there's absolutely interest in um, how music can be used for crowd control, how it can be used to, um, you know, maybe not torture prisoners, but to discipline them and rehabilitate them. There's a whole kind of um, strain of listening while you're sleeping to help you sort of overcome your drinking problems and your criminal behavior. So this is also like unconscious ear training and mood manipulation. And, and then of course, you know, by the middle of the Cold War, there's some real anxiety um, in the public about the use of, you know, music in public spaces um, as a sort of a larger kind of totalitarian control. There's, and yet, um, it becomes more ubiquitous than ever, right? And so, you know, there's music in lobbies, there's music in elevators, there's music while you're on hold, there's, you know, it becomes this kind of um, curtain, the sonic curtain um, that, that lines all human space, um, certainly in the United States, especially. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Huey. And that's uh, all the time we have for questions. Thank you. Your questions. We will conclude with a few words from Joanna Behrman, the Assistant Public Historian at the Center for History of Physics. Thank you all again for coming to this Trimble Lecture with Dr. Alexandra Huey. This lecture has been recorded and will be made available for viewing on our YouTube channel 
AIP history programs. For updates on future Trimble lectures, you can follow us on Twitter or subscribe to our email list on our website. The next Trimble lecture will be given by Nancy Greenspan on Wednesday, November 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Her lecture is titled Atomic Spy, The Dark Lives of Klaus Fuchs. We hope that you'll join us then.